Hello and welcome to Sounds Heal Podcast. I am your host, Natalie Brown. I am a sound healing practitioner, a sound healing teacher, a music educator, and performing artist. And I'm just very excited to welcome you to this podcast series where we will look into a wide range of perspectives about this emerging and blossoming field of sound healing and sound therapy. We'll consider how music and sound affects us, how sound can benefit our health and wellness, and the big question of what is sound healing? We'll talk to people from all walks of life, whether they're experts, scientifically using sound, maybe they're in the medical field, maybe they're a sound therapist or a performing artist, how are they using sound for healing? What's their perspective on it? And what's their personal journey been through sound? So I want to welcome our guest today is Thomas Orr Anderson. And I discovered Thomas in a time that I was um, kind of really digging into the sound healing and sound therapy field. You know, as a musician, as an artist, and a music lover, I have experienced the effects of sound and its power. And as a practitioner with my clients, there's just been so many amazing experiences and feedback but I wanted more information, more data. Um, what is going on um, behind this practice? And kind of getting some clarity behind the science of this, the sound work. So I found this group on Facebook called The Art and Science of uh, Sound Healing. And that's really what I was looking for, is people trying to discuss all the information that's going on in this emerging field. Some of it really, really interesting, but where is the information coming from? What is, is there data? Is there the information to, to back things up? Or are there perhaps things that do need to be debunked? Maybe there's some false information out there. So I was really excited to find the group, uh, really interesting discussions and been following that group quite a bit. And then I took Thomas's class that he teaches, one of his classes, Sound Therapy, the Physics of Sound and Vibration, which is now called Sound Therapy Foundations One. And this was really cool for me, you know, just being a musician for so long and, and now into sound healing, just getting kind of a ground to my knowledge. Okay, you know, what what are... Uh, what's going on with harmonics, wavelengths, resonance, and entrainment um, scientifically? What are we talking about? And cymatics, vibrational geometries, just kind of deepening my understanding of those things that are happening within sound and music and, and using sound therapeutically. So this class was so much fun uh, because... It's a lot of visual stuff. Thomas is so animated about this particular field and just helping people get a deeper understanding. So I learned a lot, um, and he has an immense amount of knowledge. So I wanted to invite him to, to talk with us about sound and vibration, not only how he has experienced it in his life, but how, what he sees is going on in the field right now of sound therapy and sound healing. So, Thomas, thank you for joining us. Hello, hello. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And thanks for the lovely 
Thanks for the lovely introduction. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think where I want to start is, I know you're a musician, you're a physicist, a sound therapist, and an inventor as well. So I was wondering if you could kind of lead us through that progression when it comes to your background and and how it's led you to who you are today. It's kind of leading us in a timeline or a story in a way of of who you've been and who you are now. Cool. I'll try to condense the uh, long adventurous story as best I can. Um, I grew up in a household where music was just a part of life. We always had a, one of our primary rooms in the house was a music room. My dad was playing guitar to me, you know, from before I was born, when I was in my mother's belly, he was playing guitar and singing. My brother plays guitar and sings, and we had lots of friends always passing through playing music. And my father is also a mathematics teacher. And a lot of his friends, or a lot of the family friends, were philosopher, mathematician, artist kind of folks. And uh, there were a lot of really intense philosophical and scientific and mathematical discussions and such going on around my house all the time. And then also, my my parents, when I was... Uh, before I was born, probably more, but also when I was a kid, they were pretty deep into yoga and meditation and also nature lovers. My mom ate all macrobiotic diet when I was in her womb, and they lived in the rainforest and were, you know, kind of on the same sort of style of life that I like. I live up in the mountains now and like to be around nature and like music and science and math and stuff. So I kind of continued in that part of what I was born into. And I was always a sort of a science whiz. I found science probably just easy. And math math and science were kind of like the easy classes for me. They were like, oh, this just makes sense. I don't have to memorize anything. I just have to do what makes sense. So it was always kind of obvious that I was going to be a scientist or an engineer. And I uh, proceeded to go to engineering school. And uh, I always played music, though. I I played in bands. I mostly played drums as my main instrument because everyone else played guitar and sang, so we needed a drummer, so it makes sense. And when I went to college, I first went to Tulane. I... uh, got exposed in New Orleans to all kinds of things like going to sort of things in the sort of magical realm. Uh, Like there were voodoo stores and voodoo wizards and stuff standing around and all this really far out stuff that I'd never been exposed to and didn't know anything about. And uh, also in New Orleans, I was exposed to a very, very, very unhealthy lifestyle, and so decided after my first year of college to move to Flagstaff, Arizona, where I continued engineering school and then ended up switching to physics, and there in Flagstaff, it's right next to Sedona and also next to the Hopi and Navajo reservations, and there's this really strong cultural undercurrent of healing arts and ancient indigenous wisdom paths and uh you know all you know there's always qigong masters around and native medicine men and you know tibetan monks or tibetan lamas teaching classes and uh you know every form of sort of natural healing and meditation and yoga that kind of stuff. And I'd never really been around anything like that too much, having grown up in a little tiny town in Tennessee. And basically, I absorbed every drop of it. I I went to every class, 
to every workshop, uh, studied with every teacher, went and found every medicine person and every Qigong master. I just wouldn't, I would just follow these people around and learn everything I could. And simultaneously, I took up a really strong practice of meditation and yoga and then Qigong became sort of uh, my sort of primary interest to where I was practicing Qigong so much, like six hours a day, it was just all I could do because I realized that uh, meditating and practicing Qigong were actually making my actual person a more positive influence in the world. And then whenever I was doing something else, I felt like I was potentially robbing the world. So I found it difficult to continue going to classes because I could be meditating in the forest. And it's like I could be doing my calculus homework or I could be meditating. So uh, I'm trying to shrink all this down. I ended up being the apprentice of this Zen master healer who essentially convinced me, he didn't say it directly, but basically I was led to quit college after four years and I had a really, really high GPA and I only had one year left to have a physics degree. And uh, I quit college, I left my girlfriend, I got rid of everything I owned, much to my family's dismay, because they had probably given it all to me as, you know, being a college student and left my band, left everything, and got a one-way ticket to Hawaii to work as his apprentice. And then my first day there, he told me, uh, he said, I've got nothing left to teach you. Get lost. And in retrospect, having studied a lot more about Zen tradition. I realized that was a really traditional treatment of a student by a Zen teacher and that the proper response would be to not leave or to sit on his doorstep the next morning and not move until he finally accepts me in. I didn't realize that. Anyway, so I, as distraught as I surely was, I decided, well, I guess I meant to just live in the jungle alone for the rest of my life and live off the land. That was what I thought was obvious. And so I proceeded to attempt that. So I lived in the jungle and tried to survive on fruits and uh, eventually tried to figure out how to get fish and such and had a very, very difficult time of it and almost died uh, in a variety of ways. But, um, Basically, after three three months or so of that, I had a dream where I saw very clearly that my love for science and my love for music and my love for healing arts were actually all one thing, whereas before that, I felt really pulled in these different directions, like I can either be a scientist or I could be a healer, or I can be a musician. And I couldn't choose between them, and I was incredibly distraught and torn and felt like my life was being pulled apart. And in one dream, I saw that they were really a unity. So I came back to the mainland. I ended up sort of accidentally enrolling back in a university in Nashville and studied physics and ended up getting my finishing a bachelor's and master's degrees in physics. And meanwhile, during that period of time, I had, uh, I had, I had gotten to where I was doing a lot of sort of healing sessions for people. I would do acupressure. I got trained during all that time in acupressure. And I would do acupressure for people's headaches and various things. And people would come to me as a, a therapist of some sort, sort of a Qigong therapist, I suppose. And um, I had learned to play didgeridoo. And one day I pointed a didgeridoo at somebody and played it on them. 
and had an experience where the same techniques or processes I was utilizing in my chi healing sessions or my acupressure sessions, I was able to do precisely the same thing through the sound of the didgeridoo, but it had a really huge advantage because people didn't have to have any sensitivity in order to feel it. If you point a didgeridoo at somebody and vibrate them, pretty much anybody can feel it because, I mean, it's... Mm -hmm. It vibrates you like you're on an airplane or a bus or something. It's a very tangible vibration. It's not subtle. You don't have to sense chi or prana or ki or anything like that. You don't have to be a practiced meditator to feel it or something. You just feel it because it's literally vibrating you. And, you know, you can, in a laboratory, measure the vibrations. And so all of a sudden, I discovered on my own this, sound therapy. And it, this was quite a while back, and this was before I had ever heard of anything like sound therapy or sound healing. I went to bookstores and libraries. There were no books that I could find anywhere. I finally found one book in a bookstore about it, and I didn't really like the content of it very much. So as far as I knew, I was kind of the only person really into this in the world. I, as far as I knew, I sort of invented it. And then over the course of a number of years, I ended up having an office where I did sound therapy treatments for people. People would invite me to, to do sessions for big groups at meditation centers and such. And over the course of the years doing that while I was finishing graduate school, I it started to become a popular trend and all of a sudden there were lots of books available about it. There were other people like buying tuning forks and doing, uh, you know, tuning fork therapies. And then there were people coming to do gong concerts and all of a sudden it started turning into this phenomenon that everyone was familiar with. Mm -hmm. But the, the things people were saying about it didn't make sense generally. People would say a lot of stuff that, as far as I knew, based on my knowledge of music and my knowledge of physics, of sound, things that were just absolutely not correct. And so, basically, I started very decidedly to teach about the physics of sound and vibration to people that were interested in sound healing or sound therapy. Because from my perspective, having come from physics uh, knowledge prior to studying sound therapy and musical knowledge, having been a musician, it seems to me that if you understand how sound works and you have some sort of facility with uh, playing an instrument and you have some knowledge of the human sort of energy system, like how you perceive the body as a sort of energetic system. And from my perspective, chi, but with other people, prana, or, you know, there's lots of different ways of conceiving of, uh, you know, an energy system in the body. That if you have knowledge of all of those, sound therapy or sound healing is uh, very logical, sensible, and almost obvious. You know, for example, if you want to move someone's attention into a part of their body where they don't have attention, like somebody doesn't really feel their lower body very well, you can play sounds down there and vibrate them and their attention goes there. And then all sorts of benefits come from it. So anyway, I took up teaching a lot about this and it kind of, I guess, led into sort of a niche of being kind of one of the only people in the world, as far as I can tell, who specifically teaches the physics of sound and vibration in the context of healing. And uh, lots of other things, of course, have happened through that. I ended up, I started building a sound immersion tables or sound tables, massage tables that play sound into your body. And 
I built one and people tried it and everybody wanted one. So I kept building more of them and I got better and better at building them, improved them, and have since seen an extraordinary results from people lying on these sound tables without having a person there to administer the sounds to them. So I started seeing like, there's only so much I can do or so much some other therapist can do. But with sound tables, there doesn't have to be a therapist present. So I got pretty focused on building those. And uh, also in the midst of it, I've conducted uh, a good bit of research. I was the director, the research director of an integrative health center. And so for a few years, I had a really nice laboratory uh, with biofeedback, neurofeedback, and heart rate feedback equipment and sound table and gongs and all sorts of tools of that sort and a uh, a neurosurgeon working with me and a bunch of other therapists of a variety of sorts. And I got to do conduct a great deal of research. It was generally informal. Um, It was generally all sort of pilot study that were going to lead up to because in order to do uh, really official studies that involve something that could be considered medical, you have to go, you know, it's a long journey to get approved and you got to you know, do all these things. So there's a lot of pilot studies, you know, just kind of seeing what happens when this happens and seeing what happens when this happens and seeing what kinds of results people were getting from sound. And it's really uh, unbelievable the kind of benefits people get from sound. Um, But it's also not well understood. And what most people say about it is generally not, it's generally based in some sort of misconception of how sound works. And uh, so as as I've met you through this Facebook group, the art and science of sound healing, I've also met a lot of other people from around the world who have tremendous knowledge and experience, people that have been working as a, in sound therapy for many decades and such, and I've gotten to have a lot of communications with people from around the world who have a lot of knowledge about these things. And there's a general agreement among those people about the fundamental, uh, about some fundamental things and some fundamental mistakes that are being passed around and the information about the topics. But hopefully, uh, I kind of uh, told a little of my story and a little bit of my philosophy, I guess, all in one. one Absolutely. Take. Hopefully, it answers your question. Yeah, what I mean, what a fascinating journey you've had, and I wonder if you could share. <laughs> I <laughs> I wonder if you could share, you know, you were you were ta- you were just talking about being able to work in that lab. I mean, how amazing would that be just to be able to uh <laughs> try out some things? Was there something you found? You said that you know, generally you were finding these amazing benefits of sound. Was was there something that you found that would kind of clarify something that is generally a misconception? about sound and and how it heals. Was there any of your lab work that was able to highlight a benefit, but also kind of show that maybe we we have a misconception about something? Yeah, this, and like I said, all of these studies were informal, that they were all kind of, this this place was intended to run for a very long time. Uh, At the time we were assuming right now, you know, 10 years later, we'd be in the midst of these long-term studies. Mm. And at that point, we were basically kind of testing out what we would want to go through a great deal of trouble to do an official study about. But this is uh, one thing that I think is really crucial and seldom known is that, and this is based on my experience with it, is that the particular sound used or the particular frequencies used are 
not as important as people think. That the sound, the the it's generally believed or taught in this burgeoning field of sound therapy or sound healing that essentially that it's that sound is beneficial in a way very similar to the way we have learned that pharmaceuticals or vitamins, that is something like a chemical. Like, for example, you know, you take vitamin C and then vitamin C has this particular action in the body that has these certain benefits. Vitamin D helps with your uh, immune system, among other things. And, you know, uh, sugar gives you energy, you know, things like that, where there's sort of this chemical process where a specific chemical in our diet has a specific result in our body. And we've been trained to think of medicine that way for, you know, because that's what our medicine system is largely based on. I call it the pharmaceutical model. But, and so generally people have construed that is the same way with sound. For example, you are, you know, depressed and you need this frequency or your liver is having trouble and you need this frequency or your, this chakra is out of balance and you need this frequency. That there's this uh, just common belief that sound therapy works that way, that it's a pharmaceutical, chemical kind of thing. And what I witnessed was that it doesn't matter so much what the frequency is or what the sound is as long as it's an appropriate sound. For example, if you get a really low bass note, like a deep didgeridoo, and play it on someone, it will uh, sort of act, well, they'll feel it, for example, in their lower body, in their gut, in their belly, their legs. They'll feel it really strong in their sort of, uh, if, if you think in terms of chakra system, in their lower chakras, generally. But it won't depend on whether it's a really low C didgeridoo or a low B didgeridoo or a low E didgeridoo. That really deep, deep tones respond to certain aspects of our being. And really high tones respond to other aspects of our beings. Not the actual frequency itself like a chemical. And that, for example, if I get a tuning fork, give me any tuning fork, regardless of the frequency, and the kind of therapy that I could help someone with, for example, doing kind of an acupressure, you know, putting on one acupressure point, which brings their attention into that point because you're vibrating it. So a tuning fork is really good for putting vibration into a very specific location. So you use a tuning fork, it's going and vibrates, you know, the tip of your finger. Your attention goes to the tip of your finger, no matter what frequency that tuning fork is. And then you go to the next acupressure point, and then the next, and then the next, and the next, and progressively move the person's attention through this pathway in their body. So you've opened a pathway in the person's body that... And that's the essence of uh, acupuncture or acupressure or uh, any sort of chi or energy-based therapy is you're opening up energy channels and that block energy channels are the source of our illnesses and problems. And so if you use a tuning fork to open up that energy channel, it doesn't matter what tuning fork you use. You can use any tuning fork, any frequency. It, it's not that the frequency itself is what's having the effect. It's the sound presence in the body interacting with the person's nervous system. 
the sound itself is a the a sound wave is this unified whole. So, for example, if you play a sound, you know, touch someone with a tuning fork, then some of the cells in their body are vibrating in unison with some other cells in their body because of the sound being input into the body by the tuning fork. So if I play a tuning fork, you know, that's tuned to 256 hertz or one that's tuned to 300 hertz, both of those have the same wave shape. The characteristics of the wave, regardless of the frequency, the, the, the sine wave is the same wave regardless of it, what frequency it is. It's just whether it's more condensed or what more spread out. And in my experience, that unification process, the unifying of disparate parts of ourselves by sound is the uh, primarily responsible for the benefits such that I can use a drum tuned to any frequency or use a tuning fork tuned to any frequency or even a flute tuned to any root note or didgeridoo tuned to any note or gongs tuned to any key and do the same type of therapy. And that's very, very, very uncommon belief. It's just taken for granted that sound therapy depends primarily on the actual frequencies. Whereas in all my experience, that doesn't matter. I am not saying that the frequencies don't matter at all, but that the frequencies are uh, very much secondary to the unifying property of sound itself. That sound, if you play a sound and you listen to it, if you're deciding, you know, you're like, I'm going to have a therapeutic experience with sound. So you lie down and you either have a person playing sounds for you or you, you know, put on your favorite sound album or however you want to do it or lie on a sound table. You first of all have set this intention that you're doing something good for yourself right off the bat. If you just lie on the floor with no sound with the intention of doing something good for yourself, you're going to have benefit. Then the sound adds something else to it. What does it add? One thing that it adds is that it unifies so many aspects of us. And all of modern psychotherapy is based on essentially unifying disconnected parts of our mind. You know, we repress, we have something bad happen to us, for example, in our childhood. We repress that memory, and then there's this sort of closed-off area of our mind, repressed area of our mind, that then through psychotherapy can be uncovered and reintegrated. And sound has that same type of action. It integrates us. So if I listen to a sound, not only is my body, especially a, a, a sound that vibrates in my body, not only is my body physically responding to it, but also my mind, because I'm hearing it. And so it unites and unifies our mind and body but then also separate parts of our body. My hand is vibrating to that sound, and so is my elbow. And so now my hand and my elbow are unified by means of the sound because they're being vibrated together. And also separate uh, regions of our nervous system are being vibrated together. Kind of like if you get, uh, get 100 people in a room and then get them all to dance together, there's going to be a benefit to all those people regardless of the BPM to which they're dancing. It doesn't matter what frequency they're all dancing to as much as it does the fact that they're all dancing together. And so I believe the primary benefit of sound is essentially that, that it gets us 
dancing together, all the different parts of ourselves, the different parts of our consciousness, the different parts of our body, the different parts of our nervous system, gets them all dancing together. And dancing together or cooperating is essentially health. And not dancing together or not cooperating is illness. So my liver is not cooperating with my kidneys, I'm sick. If they're cooperating, I'm healthy. If And so it doesn't matter what frequency everybody's dancing together so much as it does that they're dancing together. And likewise, it doesn't matter so much what frequency is uh all the parts of my body and mind are dancing together so much as it does that they're dancing together. If if I were to say there was a really significant single finding from my experiment, that would be it. And it's something that is, uh, interestingly, a very rare perspective, which I'm uh, working to change. I just wrote a chapter in a book. It's called The Unifying Property of Sound. And uh, that book's called Being in, in Biology. Maybe you could put a link to it on this podcast sure. for anyone interested. But, yeah, hopefully that wasn't too long, but that's uh, that's definitely my answer to that question. And hopefully I made it clear. Absolutely. I think using the words unifying and that a particular vibration brings attention to an area, especially where you first started with talking about the didgeridoo, whether it's a low C or a low F sharp, it's more the range of the instrument that brings it to a specific area. So that brings into mind your recent study that I participated in, which is, you know, virtually talking about where do you feel tones energetically in your chakras? Because there is this system that people talk about that if you use the note C, you feel it in your root chakra. And that could be any C. That could be a really low C. That could be a really high C. And then if you're playing the note F, you should feel it in your heart, right? So people kind of, some people follow that particular system. And so you did a tone study very recently that I'd love you to talk about how you put it together, what it looked like, and what you're getting from the results so far. Yeah, great. I'm excited to to talk about that. It's it's actually really, really surprising to me, the results, at least some aspects of them. And I think they'll be surprising to most people. Um, to, for the listeners to explain the study, basically what the participants would do, I made a video, and uh, the video would had kind of a, a chart showing you know, a person and showing the locations of seven chakras, root, belly, solar plexus, heart, throat, third eye, and crown. And then the video would play a a single tone, one frequency sound, a sine wave. It wouldn't tell them what tone it was. And then it would play for four seconds. And then they'd have to pick one out of seven chakra regions where they felt it most. About half the participants used headphones and half the participants used speakers, which is really, really fortunate because it turns out that the fact that, you know, half of each used, that that was half and half, really gave us some really extra interesting results. But basically, as the results came in, I, I would see these 22 tones for each person. So there were basically 22 questions that each person would answer saying where they felt it, chakra one through seven. And as the results were coming in, I was graphing them as they came in. There were right off the bat really strong patterns. I expected it to be more likely to be random, but there were actually very strong patterns where people were feeling them statistically in the same places. And it turned out 
that, well, first of all, I use the C major scale because the most common lore about chakras and tones is that the C note relates to your root chakra, the D note to your belly, the E, F, G, A, B, so B at your crown, and that it's just generally believed for uh, kind of sketchy reasons, but it's generally believed in the sort of the public mind that that correspondence is some sort of well-known fact. But as I investigated sources of it, the sources of it are pretty sketchy. And then I did an experiment when I worked at that lab where I, I basically did the same experiment and uh, found that definitely, at least not in all the participants I tested, w there was no correlation between the C major scale and the seven chakras. So I started out with this study using the C major scale just, first of all, to see if that is true. And um, basically, there were really strong patterns, but those patterns are not the C major scale. There are some cor correlations. For example, the low C, which was, uh, the lowest C was C2, which is what, like seven, right? I don't, I don't remember the hertz. I have to look. I don't memorize frequencies <laughs> for the notes. But uh, the lowest one, people overwhelmingly felt it in their root chakra. Most people answered that they felt the lowest C in their root. So that corresponds to the common teaching. But then also the highest C, which was, I believe, C5, was overwhelmingly felt in the crown chakra. Mm. So one of those notes fits the idea of, you know, the progression of the seven chakras and the C major scale, but the other one doesn't. And then for most, for all the notes that were patterned, where say, you know, sort of cluster patterns where 30% felt it, say, in the belly and then 20 in the solar plexus and then 10 in the heart or something, some sort of pattern. And if you look at the video, and maybe she'll put a link, maybe you'll put a link Definitely. to that on, on this. If you watch the video, I make a video where it shows the results and shows where people felt them. Um, so basically what we found, and it's, it's a little bit too complex to just say, you'll have to actually look at the, the results, um, but that there are definite patterns in where people felt certain notes. And then the most interesting part is that those patterns are the same, and this is what surprised me the most, those patterns are the same whether or not people are using headphones or speakers. So it didn't depend on them actually having their body vibrated in that region. Because the people using headphones obviously weren't vibrating their belly. And people would feel the note just as much in their belly, whichever ones corresponded to the belly the most. They'd feel those in the belly whether they're using headphones or speakers. Um, one overarching pattern was that overall lower notes people tend to feel in lower chakras and higher notes people tend to feel in higher, higher chakras. That's the broadest definite pattern in the data. And that's what I already believe. It makes the most sense uh, logically to me. Uh, so a high C as has been demonstrated in this study, a high C, someone's more likely to feel in their head area, and a low C, someone's more likely to feel in their root or belly. So I think that's pretty much a summary mm -hmm. of it. Yeah, I think, uh, I'm so glad you did this study. I think it's something that I've wondered about in my own learning and, and what I've looked into. So there's a lot to reflect on there. I, I'm really glad you did it. It'll be exciting just to continue to look at it. 
more more and more discoveries the more you look at it i'm sure yeah i'm i'm in the midst it's actually pretty time consuming i'm in the midst of graphing all the different representations of different variables and such and also working on making the representations in sort of non-traditional formats where more general viewer sort of a general you know public isn't so comfortable reading 50 graphs and mm -hmm. absorbing the meaning of them mm -hmm. so i'm attempting to uh i'm not attempting i'm putting it in various visual and even video formats so people can really get the data and get the patterns without necessarily having a background in you know reading graphs because a lot of people aren't that comfortable reading graphs i am very comfortable reading graphs <laughs> but i've been trained in that and so i definitely want people to get the information and not have have it just be suitable for you know some sort of scientific subsection of the population. Right. Will you um, develop the study further, or like now that you've done this one, is there something that that you are like, oh, I really want to, you know, further this study, or something else that you want oh, to attempt similar to this? Definitely, and that's something I've actually intended to talk to you personally about um, on another occasion, not on the interview, but. Definitely, I want to make uh, a, a, a basically a more elaborate version of this that has basically imagined the same study. So with this study, we had 22 different notes. And really what we need is all the notes in between. Mm. And you can't get some an individual to sit there and do an hour long study very easily. So I, I had to shrink down the number of notes and also the n amount of time each person spent with each note in order to get the video or the, you know, to get it to where it only took about five or 10 minutes for a participant, but it can be divided, you know, say one person is watching one video with one set of notes and they are answering questions. Another person is answering another set of another set of notes, and then basically you could take a say 500 notes in some range, <clears throat> and then divide that into you know 50 different videos or something, and have those videos distributed to different people because there's plenty of people in the world to do this study. So basically, to do the study again but to do it with a much broader population and be able to get more data of the notes in between so that we could really get an idea of, you know, uh, see a continuity in the data. Because this, this was jumping by whole steps and half steps. Mm -hmm. And so we have no idea about the frequencies in between. Whereas if we had an, enough data points, we could see patterns and it would, the, the importance of this result is not to be underestimated. I mean, it's extraordinary. If, if everybody feels certain parts of their body activated by a certain note overall statistically, regardless of their listening environment or how they feel that day and such, that the implications for musical composition, uh, the implications for uh, studying uh, how music that already exists makes us feel in relationship to tracing pathways through our body. For example, if you you know take a box cello suite, if we had the, this data for every note on one of these cello suites, we would have some sort of pathway that one of those compositions describes through someone's body. And that's information that people talk about, but it hasn't actually existed. And so conducting this study on a widespread basis to really get 
a huge database I think is of tremendous importance, but it'll take, it'll take a team. Um, it's not, it can't just be a one man job, you know, sending it out to his friends on Facebook. It has to be a, an effort, uh, a collaborative effort. So I am pretty sure that's going to happen one way or another. And, uh, the implications for the future of musical composition and also for musical analysis and for understanding how sound works with our body. Uh, is, yeah, it's pretty exciting. I didn't expect such powerful results. Well, I, w- I would like to clarify uh, something that might appear to be contradictory in what I've said so far. First of all, you asked me you know, what was a really sort of substantial finding from my experiments working in or experience working in that lab. And I said that in general, the frequency you use doesn't matter. And then I proceeded to describe a study I just did that in a sense uh, proves that the frequency does matter. So that might at first appear contradictory, but Rather than uh, it being contradictory, I believe it's actually pointing to two definite identifiable layers. One layer being the the overarching effect of sound, uh, the unifying effect of sound. And then the second layer being the effect of very particular sounds. And so like I was describing for dancing, Say you put on a song and it's at 100 BPM, 100 beats per minute, and you dance to it for 10 minutes. And then let's say you put on another song that's at 111 BPM and you dance for 10 minutes, that the overarching benefit in those two experiences will likely be the same, which is the benefit of dancing for 10 minutes to a steady rhythm. But then, of course, there are differences that are more subtle that, you know, in one case you're dancing faster than the other. And so there'll definitely be differences in the results, but the strongest core of it is from dancing. And likewise for sound, the frequency, of course, one frequency acts somewhat differently than another, but regardless of the frequency, the waveform has certain fundamental properties that are independent of the frequency, specifically being its unification property that when there's a sound wave, a sound wave is essentially unified activity among distant objects. So when when there's a sound wave, you have molecules over here and molecules over there that are separated in space that are moving together, and that that property is independent of the frequency. So I'm uh, proposing that there's kind of two layers, you know. There's, you know, in the analogy of dancing, that, you know, dancing itself is therapeutic, regardless of what you're dancing to. And then there's another layer that what song you're dancing to will change the effect somewhat. And that that's the same with sound. You can use a tuning fork therapeutically regardless of what frequency it is, have really positive results. But then you use a different frequency, those results will change somewhat. But in my experience, in a way that's far more subtle than is generally supposed. I appreciate the, yeah, the clarification. Why do you think... Or how do you think um, it's important for people in this field that's really just blossomed and is emerging to have some kind of understanding of physics, acoustics, frequencies? Why why do you think it's a good idea for people to get some clarity in in that information? Well, that's that's a big, good question. Essentially, I wonder how I can say this the easiest way. Essentially, when you're dealing with sound, sound itself is 
probably, it's one of the best understood physical phenomena. People have under, people have studied sound basically since in the whole history of science. There has been a tremendous amount of experimentation with sound um, from, you know, ancient times, you know, stories of Pythagoras realizing that, you know, the note of a, uh, that a string makes is uh, related to the tension of the string or to the length of the string, that there's these really fundamental uh, properties of sound that are really, really well known and that um, most of the, well, first of all, in my estimate, if, if you were to go get, and I've kind of, I've had conversations with other people about this and we've kind of played around with our estimates, but if you take all the information out there about sound therapy and sound healing, we, you know, sort of playfully estimated that about 90% of it is false or misleading. And that, whether it's 90% or whatever percent you want to choose, because we can't really actually make a valid percentage estimate, but some large percentage of the information available about sound healing is false, like, like blatantly false. And if you know just the basics of how sound works, just the basics, and it's not, it's not hard to get information about sound because it's been known for so long how sound waves work and frequencies and such. That's how they, you know, design instruments and uh, such. That if you know the basic physics of sound, it's, it gives you the ability to sift through all that information and have a pretty reliable compass. So, for example, one really common sound therapy teaching is that everything has a resonant frequency. And if you get... You know, go to the bookstore where they have a rack of sound healing books. Probably open every single one of them on the first chapter will tell you everything has a resonant frequency. And it's just generally assumed that that's correct. If you study the physics of sounds, even just the most basic physics of sounds, you very quickly find out that that's not true at all that basically pretty much everything that we know of in the universe has a practically infinite set of resonant frequencies. And in physics, those are called modes. And in uh, musical context, it's called harmonics and overtones. So most musicians know about overtones and harmonics. But those those are resonant frequencies. So if you have any object and you pluck it, vibrate it, hit it, it doesn't have one resonant frequency. It has a practically infinite set of resonant frequencies. And just learning the basic physics of sound makes you familiar with that. And so you won't... People in the sound therapy world generally use something like a tuning fork or a pendulum as their basic sort of the, the main example of how vibration works, that they reference everything else, that everything's like a tuning fork. A tuning fork is specifically designed to try to decrease all of the resonant frequencies except one. So a tuning fork is kind of like a pendulum. It's basically a very stiff pendulum. And there are two pendulums kind of connected to each other. It's designed to work like a pendulum. And a pendulum is a very special object called a simple harmonic oscillator, which is, if you study physics of sound, kind of, you know, one of the classic 
things you have to study is a simple harmonic oscillator. But a simple harmonic oscillator has one very specific and unusual feature, which is that it has one natural resonant frequency. So the best example of a simple harmonic oscillator that we most we all learn about when we're kids, or most of us, is on the playground. When someone's on a swing and you go push them, it swings at its own resonant frequency. There's a certain speed or rate that it goes back and forth, and that's its resonant frequency. And if you push at just the right time, you push in sync with it, then you barely have to push, and it goes really, really well. If you don't push at the right time, you have to work a lot harder. And it turns out that isn't the simple harmonic oscillator or a swing set or a pendulum that has one specific frequency is an extremely unusual thing. It's kind of uh, it's unique in the universe. The kind of like the number one or the number zero in the world of numbers. In the world of numbers, those numbers have very special properties, unlike any other number. So the the number zero, for example, has properties that if you study the number zero, it doesn't help you understand everything about all other numbers. Likewise, if you understand something that has one resonant frequency. It doesn't help you understand everything else in the universe. Our heart is not like a pendulum. Our heart doesn't have a resonant frequency. It's a very complex object that has a nested web of infinite or practically infinite resonant frequencies. And so in the sound therapy books, it'll say everything has a resonant frequency. See, like a tuning fork or a pendulum, and then they'll say, so obviously our heart also is like that, because everything in the world is vibrational. So what's the frequency of the heart? And then they'll give you some frequency in a chart. And it makes a lot of sense if you don't know some of the basic physics of sound and vibration, being that something like a heart can't have just one frequency. They'll have an infinite web of frequencies. And also, um, the another aspect that I interviewed uh, um, Dan Russell, this acoustical physicist. I don't know if you heard mm-hmm. that interview. But uh, he's the one who brought this up to, to me, which I find really helpful. Something he pointed out is that also not only does do most things in the universe have a practically infinite set of resonant frequencies, they also, most things in the universe are not resonant. So it's uh, a tuning fork is very resonant. A singing bowl <laughs> is very resonant. Mm-hmm. It responds. If you hit it, strike it, pluck it, it rings out. It's very resonant. Take a lump of silly putty. Lump of silly putty is not resonant at all. It's really hard to to pluck or hit or strike or rub a silly putty ball and get any sound to come out of it, right? It doesn't resonate. And most things are not very resonant. The things that are resonant are the things that we make musical instruments out of. But... Um, a ball of silly putty is not particularly resonant. And likewise, most of the structure of our human body is not very resonant. Like if you get a sponge and fill it with honey, like soak up honey into a sponge, it's very, very, very much not a resonating thing. You can try to find whatever frequency you want, and it's not going to go very easily and and vibrate and resonate. Um, And likewise, most of the human tissue is not very resonant. But interestingly, oh, and we're lucky, we're lucky that our bodies aren't resonant 
because if they were, our body tissue would be so incredibly sensitive to our environment that it would kill us if we rode on a bus or an airplane. Most of what people teach about sound therapy, if it were true, we would all die and decompose so quickly if we were so resonant as everyone proclaims. We're very fortunately not very resonant. We're not sensitive to vibrations. Our structure doesn't rearrange itself very easily. We're really lucky that frequencies don't actually really quickly reorganize our DNA. Or we would, you know, ride on an airplane and then, uh, you know, our children would be born with three noses or something. We're, we're really lucky. But our nervous system, on the other hand, is extremely sensitive to vibrations. And uh, so that's kind of, yeah, going into a different area and not talking about why it's important to know the physics. But I just wanted to bring that up that our bodies are not particularly sensitive to uh, vibrational influence for our well-being. But our nervous system is extremely sensitive to vibrational influences because it's designed to pick up environmental cues to help us survive. And I think that a lot of the future of sound healing will be focused on a lot more on the nervous system and its response to sound and not so much on the idea that you know, you're literally vibrating the molecule yourselves and that that's the reason sound makes helps you so much, but that instead you're vibrating the nervous system, which is then directing the actions of the cells. But yeah, I, I kind of jumped onto another train, but yeah, to summarize, knowing the basic physics of sound and vibration gives one the ability to navigate this world of information where a lot of it is misleading or false. And it also gives you the ability to work with sound knowledgeably. Um, you can, if you just know the physics of sound and vibration and you have any sort of sensibility to people's bodies and there, you have a, any sort of training in sort of health or massage or yoga or qigong any sort of body centric healing arts if you combine that with a knowledge of a basic knowledge of the physics of sound without learning anything from anyone else i think you could set about having a very uh successful path of sound therapy for yourself or for helping others um yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. It does. And um, I, I think I want to shift the direction just a little bit and ask you personally how this field has affected your life, right, in your own experience. Because I like on Facebook, I've seen you write about trail running and as sound therapy. So I'm just wondering in your own life, in your own practice, how sound has been therapeutic for you wow that's a it's kind of like <laughs> asking someone to describe everything they've eaten in their whole life or something <laughs> it's a big, a big 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 question but maybe i can uh you know bring up a couple key points yeah. um one thing when i first started meditating a lot um in my meditation practice and this kind of kicked off right around in my second year of college i started meditating a great great deal just kind of you could it'd be hard to find me when i wasn't meditating and i right off the bat i started my meditation practice by saying oh, oh. Ohming. And I would also, uh, I took up the practice of 
doing it outdoors a lot and then generally by water. So my favorite, and it's still my favorite thing to do, is to go sit by a stream, a running stream, that notably is vibrating the rocks that I'm sitting on. So when you have, you know, a stream going by, it's like... You have all this sound coming from the water, and then that sound is also resonating up through the rocks. And between every rock, there's little resonant cavities, so different frequencies are being or different frequency ranges are being resonated by different rock formations and sitting there and saying, Oh, and through, uh, learning to say, Oh, one thing is in order to pronounce it well, you have to, uh, adjust your posture. And so when I was learning how to say it, deeply I would have to adjust you know my spine uh, adjust how my uh, diaphragm is seated and the position of my shoulder blades and my neck and my throat and my uh, rib cage basically the the process of exploring that sound and opening it up and making it deep and resonant and being able to hold the note for a long time that process is basically you're you're listening to the sound and then having to you're adjusting your body and that adjusting your body adjusts the sound so it's a sort of biofeedback where by just exploring that sound you're essentially being led through yoga of some sort and so that's really probably where my sound therapy practice or my life of sound therapy really kind of its roots is through the sound own through making a sound in one's own body and then feeling how and hearing how adjusting the body adjusts the sound and so the sound is the feedback to know what's inside your body and then, of course, while meditating, your, the posture and the sound are also adjusting one's state of mind or one's consciousness or one's concentration level or what types of emotions are distracting you. So, for example, if you're working, if you're sitting in oming, you're also, say, having to at some point adjust your heart area to open up the to open up certain harmonics of it. And so as you're adjusting your heart area, but you're trying to focus on the sound ohm because you're meditating, when you are adjusting your heart area, there's certain sort of emotional states associated with different parts of our body. So in our heart is where we feel, uh, and I'm sure everyone listening, I don't have to tell you, but you feel certain emotions sort of around your heart area, whether it be positive emotions like joy and such, or uh, negative emotions like uh, grief and regret. And so in the midst of adjusting my heart, in order to open up the sound, I'm also feeling whatever sorts of emotions are there that are preventing my opening it up so for example if you have a lot of grief in your heart your literal your literal actual physical posture in your heart area will tend to collapse and so if you look at somebody who's really sad you can essentially tell by how they're standing or sitting overall unless you know statistically not every time But overall, you tend to collapse your heart area when you're sad. And so when we are working on opening up our heart area, we are necessarily exploring those sort of deep emotional aspects of ourselves. And if you're doing that while using the feedback of hearing the sound and how the ohm changes when you open your heart, 
basically it's this very, very uh, sort of inclusive process of meditating, of exploring your own sort of internal body and all of its relations, its positions and postures and their relationship to your deepest seated emotional and psychological states. And then also exploring sound and hearing every change in your body, hearing it reflected in the harmonic content of the sound. And then in the midst of that, sitting by the water, feeling the vibrations of the water literally vibrating your body, hearing them, and feeling the relationship between them, the, the natural sounds, and then the sounds that are coming through your body. And what I found, and, you know, I didn't find this. I mean, this is pretty traditional, ancient knowledge, is that when I really own, when I get into the place where I'm actually in a good meditation and the ohm is really resonating through me and my posture feels like it's aligned and that uh, the my sort of state of mind and state of consciousness is aligned, that it also simultaneously has this peculiar and almost magical alignment with the sounds around me of the sound of the water. So when I've had the best oming experiences, it really felt as if, or it feels as if the vibration of the water that's vibrating in the rocks from the water that I'm sitting by, that I am simply positioned so as to resonate it so that the sound of the ohm coming out of me, it feels to be literally the resonation of the natural sounds of the river resonating within my body. Mm. And so then this sense of oneness that, you know, is like sort of the cliche, the, the, the Buddhist monk ordered a hot dog. He said, make me one with everything. Kind of <laughs> the one with everything is a very, very tangible experience that I have found through that. And, uh, yeah, I guess that's one example mm -hmm. of how how it's related to my life. I guess that's sort of a practice. I don't know if I said how it changed my life, which is maybe what you were asking. Oh, no, yeah. I was just wondering how it's affected you and your own experience. So, yeah, that, that does answer it. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> and I think... I go far, so, so far into my answers that I to where I was like, wait, what was the question again? I'm just telling this story. I think it's in depth enough that even though it's that particular experience by the water, that it relates to probably your experience overall with sound. So, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, um, I definitely, and I think that this is surprisingly unusual in the world of sound healing and sound therapy, the people that are into sound healing and sound therapy, which is a whole lot of people now, that I, it's strange to me that this is unusual, but this is unusual, is I have a very strong focus on the sounds of nature, that when I go to, I go to waterfalls, probably on average, the last over the whole last year, probably average about four times a week. Mm. I, I live around waterfalls. I've chosen the place where I live because I'm surrounded by waterfalls. And the sounds of nature, letting the sounds of nature penetrate my entire being, let my whole body be vibrated by them, let my mind be filled with them, and then let the sounds that come out of me harmonize with them. That, in my experience, has been the most sort of perfect. Mm. Uh, I'm reluctant to use that word, mm -hmm. but 
in this case, I feel comfortable saying it, the sort of the most perfect version of sound therapy. Mm. And it's, it's so far removed from any theories or any thing somebody claimed or someone's idea or traditions. And it's just directly experiencing beauty through sound and have having every aspect of what's happening inside me uh, harmonize with everything happening outside of me through the experience of sound, both physically and, you know, uh, mentally, um, just every level of sound of my being harmonized with the beauty of nature by means of the language of sound. And that's really uncommon. I think probably mostly because most people live in cities and Secondly, because the sound therapy world is uh, very market driven and you can't really, I can't really sell that experience to anyone <laughs> and, and nobody else can so easily. So a lot of the information about sound is, you know, usually selling something and the waterfall is, thank goodness, free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's why I really... Uh, appreciate your perspective on things because I mean as you say it is the art and the science it is the experience the oneness the allowing the sound to encompass encompass you as well as an understanding of a deeper understanding of the science of it that creates that balance it's not not necessarily one or the other um, yeah, yeah. I'd like to comment on that, if I may. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah, to be clear, because I end up talking a lot about the science side of it, because that's basically I am a teacher of that. Mm. It's a it's a part of the knowledge that is there's not many people that know about the physics of sound that are also interested in sound therapy, and so I. I'm in the position of oftentimes teaching the physics part and the science part. And that part is so incredibly important right now because it helps to, uh, helps to correct a lot of mistakes that I think are holding us back collectively. But I want to clarify that my relationship to sound is far from scientific in general. I don't use science much if I am playing music or listening to nature or, uh, you know, doing a sound therapy session. Science is something that I think it's good to know to set sort of a, a pattern for understanding, but then the actual doing of it is I am much more of an artist. Uh, I I don't think it's a good idea to do sound therapy with science in mind in general. That there's uh, that the art art doesn't have definite rules. Um, it doesn't have art is you know a spontaneous expression of nature through us and uh, the actual practice to me is art. The understanding of it is the science. So much, much like music theory, it's like you don't want Bach to be thinking about music theory when he is actually spontaneously composing his four part piece. You want him to be expressing his artistic soul, but at the same time, the fact that he has such a fantastic knowledge of scales and harmonies and counterpoint and whatnot makes it so that when he does improvise, there's a depth to it beyond compare. Likewise, understanding the physics of sound and how sound works when 
one is doing their therapy or playing their music, it adds a level of depth that would otherwise be absent. But I, I do not in any way propose that people try to treat art from a scientific perspective. <laughs> right, it's <laughs> the, the balance of understanding, yeah. yeah. Well, so I think to start to bring this to a close, what are what's propelling you? What are you excited about? What's in the works for you this coming year? Wow, that's a uh, <laughs> big, 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 uh, big answer. If I were to, it's a big year. Huh? About it. But um, I'm finishing a new album. I'm also a musical artist. I play dance music for festivals and such. My artist name is Sirius Colors, S I R I U S, like the star, the binary pulsar. Sirius Colors. I have a new album uh, that I'm in the final stages of mixing and mastering. I'm also uh, going to be doing... Oh, actually, this is kind of an exciting thing that I think uh, answers the question sort of uh, all in one thing. I'm going to be starting with something I'm calling a Secret of Sound tour. I'm going to be traveling around the country and presumably sometimes out of the country and this is something I've done for a long time, but I'm going to be, do kind of an official uh, section of it where basically I'm going to travel around the country and uh, record sounds. I'm going to find people like maybe visit you mm-hmm. and ask you to teach me something, show me something, demonstrate something, or take me to a place where there's a special sound. And I'm going to be documenting that in audio format also in interviews, and then also uh, turning it into music and recordings, and then also demonstrating my sound immersion systems, giving people the opportunity to try out this amazing experience where you get to lie on a table and it plays sound into your body in a way that you don't otherwise get to experience ever. Demonstrating that, and then also playing concerts, and doing uh, lectures. I really, really like giving lectures and workshops. So being this, doing this tour where it's kind of uh, this mixture of all these different activities and there'll be ways to uh, keep up with me and kind of follow the adventures and uh, videos of my going into a cave and recording some magical sounds and you kind of get to follow me and then I can also come to your hometown and uh, give a talk or a lecture or a demonstration, play a concert. And so I'll be doing that. And I think in a sense that summarizes a lot. I um, also want to continue this with this study that we just did about how certain tones uh, affect people in very definite places. I want to expand that study and get a whole lot more participants I'm almost I'm just finishing a book it's actually I thought I I thought I was halfway through but now I realize it's part one and it's called symbiotic sound symbiotic sound I think that's going to be the title and uh, it's a mixture between it's sort of a story about this group of people that starting from scratch without any previous knowledge, uncover the secrets of sound. So it kind of teaches you the physics of sound through a story about people that don't know anything about it who Mm -hmm. are from scratch discovering it on their own, starting out by playing on the playground and discovering how frequencies and harmonics work by swing sets and merry-go-rounds and stuff like that. So you can keep an eye out for that. Um, I have, oh, I'm also making a film. For the last eight years or so, I have been a student of a medicine man in Mexico. His name is Tata Cachora, which means Grandfather Salamander, Grandfather Lizard. He's now 105 years old. Mm. He has uh, 44 children, uh, 
and 120 grandchildren, like 50 great grandchildren, 10 great great grandchildren, somewhere thereabouts. He's 105 years old. He is extremely healthy and active. He, I go hiking with him, and he sometimes wrestles with me. He's a uh, very strong, healthy, and one of the most, if not the most knowledgeable person alive about indigenous plant medicine. And for the last few years, we've been working on making a film about him. And uh, we'll, it looks like we're probably going to get to go finish that filming sometime this spring. And uh, a bunch of other stuff, too. But That's awesome. That's probably enough. <laughs> I'd love anybody listening to uh, get in touch with me. I really, really love anything to do with all of these topics. And I'm very uh, happy to share and love to meet people. And also, we'd love to, if you if anybody wants me to come to their town uh, on my Secret of Sound tour, please let me know and we can arrange that. That'd be fantastic. Love to meet you. What's the best way for people to kind of follow your adventures, your website? You have a blog. The Secret of Sound right now, I, I, I haven't made a new website for that, but I have a website that is my sort of sound therapy website, which is probably the most appropriate for this. It's Phi Sonic. It's P as in Paul. H as in Henry, I as in intelligent, S-O-N-I-C-S, Fisonics.com. And that's, Fisonics is my company that makes sound immersion systems and also under which I teach my sound therapy courses and lectures and also uh, research projects and there's blog and also my podcast is on there. And I'll probably be reorganizing it a little bit soon in order to accommodate the Secret of Sound tour. Um, but that's a really good place to get in touch with me. And also, uh, I have a website called SeriousColors.com. It's S-I-R-I-U-S Colors.com, which is for my performance music. And I have a podcast that's on iTunes and SoundCloud called The Art and Science of Sound Healing. And uh, definitely invite people to join our Facebook group, which is also called The Art and Science of Sound Healing. And uh, yeah, this probably, probably captures it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Thomas, for yeah. Shedding some light on this vast, <laughs> vast field <laughs> that we're involved in. I really appreciate your insight and this really cool journey that you've been on. So thank you for your time. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's funny when I watch Indiana Jones. It's always like, oh my gosh, that's actually what my life is like. <laughs> it's pretty funny. People. People sometimes think like, oh, wow, I'd like my life to be like that. But if you watch Indiana Jones, you'll see, you know, it's actually pretty uncomfortable to be on such an adventure mm. poison danger and barely about to fall off a cliff or something. <laughs> I definitely am in, you know, I'm always in some crazy adventure like that. But I love, uh, I love to get to be alive. And it's really an honor to be a guest on your show. I'm, yeah, really excited. And, I would definitely be happy to come back anytime. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining this first episode of Sounds Heal Podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Brown, and you can keep up to date on what's coming up next at soundshealstudio.com or on Facebook, Sounds Heal Studio. I look forward to more discussions about this amazing field of sound healing and sound therapy. Be well and stay tuned.